coming up. See what it's like to fly this sleek and speedy LX7 turboprop. Plus the story of a man who restored his dad's cub after it sat in a barn for decades. And see all the latest and greatest avionics from the AEA show in Dallas. AOPA Live this week begins in just a moment. This is AOPA Live This Week with Tom Haynes and Alyssa Cobb. Experimental amateur-built airplanes have come a long way over the years. From plans built to sophisticated kits, the capabilities and versatility are remarkable. AOPA editor-at-large Dave Hirschman has the story about an amazingly fast and powerful experimental, the LX-7. What do you get when you take a light, sleek airframe and add a 680 horsepower PT6 turboprop engine? Meet the LX-7. The LX-7 is a remanufactured and updated version of the Lancer 4P. The airplanes are made by RDD Enterprises in Redmond, Oregon. You just have a look at what we're doing here. It's not what you would expect, you know, four guys in a T hanger trying to slap together a bunch of composite parts. This is a very world-class manufacturing effort. The company takes a donor Lancer 4P and each airplane gets entirely new wings with a different airfoil and double slotted flaps that dramatically reduce stall speed. Slower stall speed, which means we can have a slower approach speed. And then we wanted to also attack the uh, stall characteristics issue. And by using the new airfoil and some manufacturing techniques, we've been able to get a very consistent wing from one wing to the next which gives us excellent stall characteristics and really good slow speed handling. They also get a larger, stronger vertical stabilizer, a smaller rudder, new instrument panels, and new engines. You can choose either a PT6A turboprop ranging from 500 to 750 horsepower or a turbocharged Continental engine rated at 350 horsepower. The LX-7 has an IFR three-screen Garmin G3X panel, leather interior, and custom paint. Air conditioning and a BRS airframe parachute are also standard equipment. The number one thing about it is, is the safety factor in it. You feel more relaxed and uh, comfortable flying the airplane. The LX-7 looks sleek and powerful on the ramp. The muscular look is accentuated by a long, thin cowl and the wide cord of its four-blade MT prop. Fit and finish is outstanding, and a clear coat over the three-color paint scheme provides high gloss. The LX-7 is blazingly fast and an efficient traveler. In cruise, it'll do 300 knots flat out, but a more typical cruise is 280 knots at 25,000 feet, or 260 knots at 17,000 feet, burning around 32 gallons per hour. Really, when you put the power to it, it accelerates rapidly, whether you're on a takeoff roll or if you're just in level flight and you have power. A turboprop LX-7, including the donor airplane, costs about $1.1 million. And in an age when new piston singles regularly cost that much, an as-new turboprop with dramatically higher performance at the same price is intriguing. Head and shoulders above anything else on the market, that's kind of what typically the feedback would get from our customers that have LX7s. Dave Hirschman, AOPA Live. With efficient crews under 18,000 feet, the LX7 is also an ideal airplane to fly under basic med. We will have more about it in an upcoming issue of AOPA Pilot Magazine. The Aircraft Electronics Association is holding its annual convention and trade show in Dallas this week. More than 1,500 attendees even though the large contingent of international members couldn't make it this year because of COVID travel restrictions. Some 120 companies are exhibiting there. Some of the avionics manufacturers like to use this event to showcase new gear. Aperio, for example, is showing off a new flight data monitor with 4K video. The AIRS 400 will record video, pilot intercom and radio audio, and flight data, including altitude, ground and vertical speed, attitude and acceleration data, and get this, it weighs just 11 ounces. The device is crash hardened and it will set you back $12,500. Genesis Aerosystems announced that its GDR product line has received TSO approval. 
GDR is a family of 11 remote-mounted, software-definable radios that feature combined nav and voice capabilities. They're designed to interface with a variety of controllers and displays. Genesis also received TSO approval for new enhancements to the STEC 3100 digital autopilot, including support for GPS and route vertical navigation. Garmin has added some new tricks to the GI-275 electronic flight instrument. You can now control various Garmin transponders directly from the 275, including squawk code and ident. Garmin also made it easier to switch between GPS steering and heading modes when interfaced with some third-party autopilots. Garmin also touted its Smart Rudder BIOS, available on the GFC 600 digital autopilot, available for select piston twin-engine aircraft. The unit can detect an engine failure and apply the correct flight control inputs. It will also light up an alert to show the pilot which engine has failed. Avidyne announced STC approval for the new Skytrax 200 dual-band ADS-B receiver. It will receive traffic and weather data on both the 1090 and 978 megahertz bands. It can be interfaced with a variety of displays. Well, one of the latest trends in avionics is multiple purpose units that can replace old analog instruments, or those steam gauges. They'll fit right into the existing three-inch hole cut into your panel. Now, we've already mentioned the Swiss Army knife of replacement units. That's the Garmin GI-275. But also for your replacement consideration is the UAvionics AV-30C. This unit can function as an attitude indicator or a directional gyro and includes a bunch of other functions as well. It can also control the company's tail beacon ADS-B out mode S transponder. UAvionics says the $2,000 AV-30C is cheaper than its Garmin competitor and easier to install. And RC Allen has digital replacements for the attitude and heading ed- indicators, a little more expensive than the UAvionics units, but very simple to install. You can read much more about these and other options on our website. By Aerospace just announced a launch customer for its new all-electric eFlyer 800 twin. Jetit and Jet Club signed a purchase agreement for a fleet of eFlyer 800 aircraft. Now, Jetit is a fractional ownership company here in the United States, and Jet Club operates in Europe. Currently, they operate Honda Jets. The eFlyer 800 fits into Jetit's mission to provide cost-effective travel solutions. Now, Bai says the eFlyer 800 will have similar performance to current turboprops. Cruise speed of up to 320 knots, 35,000 foot ceiling, and 500 nautical mile range. The company is targeting FAA certification in 2025. Are you keeping up with your aviation initialisms? Now, you probably call them acronyms, but our executive producer, Warren Morningstar, can sometimes be a grammar nerd, and he insists that if you can't pronounce it, it's an initialism. So here's a new initialism in the aviation world, EPU, Electric Propulsion Units. And Magniex, the folks that have electrified a beaver and a caravan, have just announced two new EPUs, the Magni 350 and 650. Both turn at 2300 RPM or less and can drive a conventional propeller governor and aircraft accessories. The Magni 650 puts out 850 shaft horsepower. And while Warren can be sometimes didactic, He wrote that, not a word I would normally use. He sometimes does have some useful information, at least for some of us. Have you ever done that? You know, I did an informal survey of pilots and it seems like a lot of us keep doing it. And you know what? There's a real simple solution. Just turn your head around. That way you've got your peripheral vision, you'll see the uh, trailing edge, and you won't bang your bloody head. Now if you bang your head on a Piper wing, there's not anything I can do for you. Okay, well thanks Warren, and I confess I have done that, although at my height that's usually not too much of a problem uh, hitting your head on too many uh, high high wings. Uh, How about you, Alyssa? You know, I've done that a number of times, too, and, and have the little uh, diamond imprint in my forehead. Mine is usually, though, because I've, I'm looking at other aircraft that are taking off or something while I continue walking go. toward the airplane. Yep, I've, I've whacked my shin a number of times on the Bonanza step, I have to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Well, coming up, an amazing J3 Cub Barn find. And looking to buy an airplane? 
We have an event for you. We'll be back in a moment. I'm a full-time filmmaker, and I integrate a lot of flying in with that and primarily produce film and videos around aviation. So I've got about 1,700 hours, about maybe three or 400 of that is dual given. My ratings are a commercial airplane single engine land, and then I'm a CFII and just recently got my tailwheel. So I use Sirius XM weather hands down all the time on four flight. We were doing performance testing off the coast of Florida and we needed unrestricted climbs with no clouds above us and we needed unrestricted descents, no clouds below us. And we actually used the cloud layer that Sirius XM feeds to the iPad and it was shockingly accurate. I really tend to gravitate toward using Sirius XM in the cockpit because of the resolution of data that it's providing me. I mean, when I'm looking at NEXRAD or weather on the horizon or, or satellite cloud layers, anything like that, the resolution of the image that it's giving me is so much higher and so much more frequent than ADS-B, especially when you're operating in an IFR environment. Welcome back. The biggest baby Boeing ever has just flown. The Boeing 737 MAX 10 took off from Renton Field in Washington Friday, and after a two and a half hour flight, landed back at Boeing Field. The largest 737 yet can carry up to 230 passengers. This was the first of a series of test flights leading to FAA certification. And in the wake of issues over the original 737 MAX certification, the FAA has launched a new safety reporting system. The program gives FAA inspectors and other safety employees a way to confidentially report issues and concerns. While such programs have been in place in other parts of the FAA, such as air traffic, this is a first for the Aviation Safety Office. Congress made them do it after the 737 MAX crashes. FAA Administrator Steve Dixon said he wanted the FAA safety troops to know they can speak up and somebody will listen. The AOPA is supporting an important bill that would fund the FAA even during a government shutdown. In early 2019, the government shutdown lasted for 35 days, and that kind of a shutdown greatly affects the FAA and takes a toll on safety. If the Aviation Funding Stability Act passes, the FAA would be funded through the Airport and Airway Trust Fund during a funding lapse. The measure would ensure the FAA can continue to operate as usual and essential employees like air traffic controllers will continue to be paid. The bipartisan bill was just introduced in the House. And if there's another reason to be grateful for the freedom to fly, it's that incidents of unruly passengers are getting frequent. And the FAA is breaking out its meme game to help stop it. Would you act this way at Meemaw's house? That's what the federal regulatory body in charge of aviation is asking on Facebook. The Fed sharing this humorous graphic in an effort to educate the public about behaving badly on flights. They point out that bad behavior puts everyone at risk and it could land you in jail or with a $35,000 fine. Not to mention a good talking to from Granny. Remember, she raised you better than this. Business aviation traffic numbers continue to outpace 2019 and 2020. The latest figures from FlightAware show even more of an uptick than we had previously seen. Last week, there were close to 13,000 turbine general aviation flights per day. That doesn't even figure in piston aircraft. It marks a 45% increase from last year and a 20% rise from 2019. And if you're an aircraft owner or are interested in buying or upgrading an airplane, we have a new event coming up just for you. AOPA will host two aviator showcases this year, one in Manassas, Virginia, one in Fort Worth, Texas. So this will be exhibit hall, aircraft display, a handful of seminars related to technology and aircraft ownership and panel upgrades. Uh, about a thousand folks gathered for this, this very personalized, up front, you know, up close event. You can have up close, high touch connection with our exhibitors and friends in the industry. So it's really tailored towards aircraft owners, uh, folks that want to upgrade equipment, panels, uh, so forth, uh, purchase an aircraft. It's really an event designed to get you connected in a very up close way with the industry uh, manufacturers and technology uh, folks that we depend on for our, our flying. The Manassas event will take place August 27th. The Fort Worth Showcase will be October 1st. Registration is required and there's a $20 registration fee. You can find show specials, a list of the exhibitors, and register to attend on the event website. Well, the Sentimental Journey Fly-In is happening this week in Lock Haven, Pennsylvania. It's a large gathering of Piper Cubs and other varieties and the beloved airplanes were built by Piper in Lock Haven for the first part of its run. And this week, we take you back in time. Not only for the story about Cubs, but to 2012, 
when the late AOPA technical editor Mike Collins found the story of a man who restored his dad's cub after it had sat in a barn for decades. Hi, my name's Greg McKnight, and this is my 1943 J3 Piper Cub. My dad flew this airplane in 1946, and I found this airplane in 1999 in pieces in, a, in the second floor of a barn. Um, put it back together in 2008, and I'm enjoying it since. It, uh, it was a very interesting find uh, to go trace my dad's old logbook entries through the FAA database and find a registration of this particular aircraft. Once I found that, I was able to then identify the owner from the pilot database and happened to be working in the same neighborhood where the owner lived and found his name in a phone book, called him up, and six months later, I was the proud owner of pieces of a J-3. The aircraft was originally owned by the Department of Defense and it was bought by Ernie Buell, uh, the owner of the Summerton Airport in Philadelphia. The aircraft stayed in the southeastern Pennsylvania area for all its entire life and ended up going up to a second floor of a barn in, in um, New Jersey, just outside of Philadelphia, um, in the 70s, about 73. And it stayed there until I found it in 99. So it, uh, it sat idle for a bunch of years. I ended up coming here to Sentimental Journey and talking with Clyde Smith, and I brought my fuselage identification number and found out that that was actually a glider fuselage number. And from that, we were able to then go talk to the folks in the museum. And when looking at the uniqueness of the square windows on the back, rather than the round-shaped rear windows, we were able to identify that this fuselage was originally a glider. Uh, the location of the throttle controls are a little bit different on this because the uh, throttle control location was for the tow hook release for the gliders. Uh, it was actually a three-person glider. Uh, the front engine part where the engine is lopped off and there was a third seat that was sitting up front there. And in 46, my dad actually flew this as a J-3 in Summerton Airport within the city of Philadelphia. 62 years to the date that my dad flew in July 7, 46, I flew this plane around the pattern at Quaker Town uh, just to be able to mark the, the same date that he flew it 62 years later. Well, AOPA Live is planning to bring you more from this year's sentimental journey on next week's show. And Tom, I understand that you'll be speaking at the event this weekend. Uh, yep, yeah, that's right. I'll be speaking at the banquet on Saturday evening, and I'll look forward to seeing a bunch of uh, Cub pilots up there. It'll be fun. Wonderful. I wish I could be there. <laughs> uh, well, you're 170. You know, it'll come in close. But <laughs> Hey, that's it for our show this week. Thanks for watching. Yep, and don't forget to share your thoughts on the show at the email address on your screen or leave us a comment if you watch on YouTube. We hope to see you back here next week. Purchasing your own aircraft is an exciting experience. AOPA Finance simplifies the process, saving you money with lower interest rates and hassle-free loans, so you get into your new aircraft sooner. AOPA Finance, the right approach to buying an aircraft.